don't know much about VPNs? That's okay, but after watching this video, you'll know everything about them. Let's get into it. To understand how a VPN works, let's start with a bit of history. Almost 40 years ago in 1983, the internet was born. Back then, it was not as cool as it is now, but the main principles that were used to build it are still here with us today. So let's talk about those principles and how they work. Let's kick off with networking. A network is basically two or more computers connected together. These computers could be next to each other, connected locally via local network, or they could be on different sides of the planet. We call these computers servers. They usually don't have a mouse attached or a monitor attached, but they don't need those things since they're only used for network communication. The problem is that computers communicate in ones and zeros, and we humans, well, we mostly use language. The main goal of networking is turning this communication between computers into something that's understandable to us, humans. Imagine accessing your Facebook account, Googling something. I mean, that's really just computers talking to each other in a way that's understandable to us. All these services that we access in a networking world are called applications. Computers communicate using algorithms and protocols, so let's try to understand those first. You may have heard about algorithms. An algorithm has three parts, an input, an output, and the steps that describe how to go from an input to an output. In a nutshell, an algorithm is a set of steps that lead to a specific calculation. To help you understand algorithms, let's create one. Now, we can actually create an algorithm in the kitchen, so let's cook up some algorithms. To make this particular algorithm, we will be using a couple of inputs, say soy milk, peanut butter, and a banana. Now, I already know what my output is going to be, which is a delicious smoothie. So what steps do I need to take to get there? In this case, the steps would be to take each one of those ingredients and mix them together. Here's our output, a yummy smoothie. So let's recap. We took our inputs, which were the various food ingredients, and we took the steps, which were putting them in a blender and mixing them together to produce our output, which is the smoothie. And that's really what an algorithm is. It's turning an input into some kind of an output by taking steps. Networking wouldn't be possible with just algorithms, which is why we need protocols. That is an agreement between two or more parties that follow a set of rules to go from an input to an output. In networking, protocols are used everywhere to transmit data between devices. For example, if I go to a fast food restaurant, I have an agreement with the employees to receive a burger. But of course, for that to work, I have to follow a set of mandatory rules like paying for the meal with my money, which would be my input. Knowing the difference between a protocol and an algorithm is important. So to quickly recap, an algorithm turns something from an input to an output, and a protocol is an agreement between two or more parties which have to follow a set of rules in order to work. All protocols and algorithms live in various networking layers. They are used in networking to separate responsibility, and they are all described by what's called a networking model, the most popular of which is called TCP IP, or also known as the Internet Protocol Suite. Fun fact, that's actually where the internet gets its name from. There are other models like OSI, but that one never took off, so let's not even talk about it. The best way to envision the TCP IP networking model would be to take a look at a sandwich. Yes, a sandwich. You see, a sandwich has different layers that are separate from each other, but they all combine into one thing. Let's analyze each one of those layers to understand how the data travels from your browser through the various layers. So at the very top, there's an application layer. This is the layer where you interact with your web browser and go to various websites. Layers also incorporate the previously discussed protocols, one of the most important of which is called the Domain Name System, or DNS for short. DNS lives in the application layer, and its primary focus in networking is the DNS protocol used to identify addresses on the internet. If, for example, after a long night out, you call a cab and you tell the driver to take you home without telling him your address, well, they won't know where to take you. But your computer has a much easier time knowing where to take you on the internet, thanks to DNS. Without DNS, you would have to enter the IP address of the website you want to visit. An IP address is the actual address of every website. Yeah, forget about simple names like youtube.com or facebook.com. So instead, your computer sends a request to DNS, which would be like a phone book of the internet and finds the IP for you. Wow, thanks DNS. Another protocol that lives in the application layer is the HTTP protocol. It gives you, the user, a way to interact with the web. So when you do access websites, your browser is actually creating application messages. These messages are made up of two parts. One is called the header, and it holds all the information about the protocol that was used to send the data. So an example of a browser message, it would contain the HTTP header. And the second part is called message data, which hosts the message that the application layer is trying to send. For instance, give me google.com homepage. After all that, the application messages are sent to the transport layer. 
Now the transport layer communicates and receives those messages through ports. And this way the transport layer knows where the data is coming from and where to send it to. It also puts application messages into small blocks called packets. Packets are then arranged by either the TCP protocol or the UDP protocol. These protocols are similar in what they do, but they execute the same task differently. TCP organizes all packets in a nice orderly manner and ensures that all of them will be delivered. Think of it like a college student who does all his homework. On the other hand, UDP is connectionless and doesn't care or know if the packets will be delivered. Kind of like another college student who wasn't as successful. All these packets are then sent to what's called the internet layer. This layer attaches destination addresses to the packets. One of those pieces of information is an IP address. Let's talk about IP addresses for a moment. You are probably familiar with IP addresses, but they are a unique series of numbers which identify computers on the web. So the internet layer adds these addresses to the packets so that they know where to go. Also, you may know that there are two types of IP addresses. IPv4 are these short addresses, but what we found out is that we may run out of them. You see, every device has its own IP. And since there are only around 4 billion unique IPv4 addresses, well, we get a problem. That's why IPv6 was introduced, which increased that number to around 300 trillion trillion trillion. Yeah, quite a bit more. Now, let's get back to those packets. Their final destination is the data link layer. At this point, frames are built out of the networking layer packets. The most common protocol in the data link layer is called the Ethernet protocol. You've probably heard about Ethernet if you ever tried setting up your router or PC. Here the frames are checked for any errors in case the frames arrive with any problems. Then they are marked with a MAC address. No, it's not a MAC computer. No, no, no. So no matter what device you have, it has a MAC address. I mentioned how every device has its own IP address, however, that is not enough for the data to know to which specific device it has to travel to. By utilizing MAC addresses, your router can tell which device is which and deliver the packets to the correct device. Lastly, the frames are also converted to electrical impulses like zeros and ones so that they can travel over Wi-Fi signals or cable. So that was quite a journey, but let me tell you, it's all worth it for this delicious sandwich we call the network. But what happens when you add multiple networks together and make it accessible to everyone? You get the internet. So the internet is something that we use literally every day. But what really is the internet? The internet is a decentralized network of networks globally accessible to anyone and everyone. The internet allows you to watch this very video right now. How cool is that? I mean, seriously. It is also not owned by anyone, governed by anyone, but instead it is a distributed system made up of lots of computer networks owned by various internet service providers, universities, governments, and other organizations. Originally, the internet was designed to be indestructible and survive a nuclear attack. The internet was built to ensure that there is no single point of failures, so backbones exist. Now, when I say backbone, I mean that there are millions and millions of routes where your data could be routed through. So if, say, Canada's network infrastructure fails, your data could still be routed through US network and so on. This is made possible thanks to internet exchange points. Each network has it and they all communicate using them. So again, think of the internet as a big, big mesh of various points connecting to one another. While the internet is amazing and all, the public nature of it makes all communication insecure. That's where cryptography comes in to save the day. It is a science which aims to achieve secure communication over an insecure network. And one of those methods is encryption. Encryption is a process of taking a message, scrambling its content so that only certain people can look at your message. In other words, taking data and making it look gibberish to anyone who's trying to snoop on you. We're going to go over two types of encryption, symmetric and asymmetric. And follow me here because it's gonna get complicated. Let's first take a look at how symmetric encryption works. For that, we need two people. Let's say Alice and Bob. Alice wants to share an important file with Bob, so she uses a private key to protect the file and sends it over to Bob. Now, Bob cannot open this document since he doesn't have the private key to open it. So how should Alice share the private key with Bob? Sending it through email would be dangerous and someone could steal the password or the key in this case. Asymmetric encryption, on the other hand, aims to fix this. The best example to envision this encryption would be to imagine a mailbox on the street. The mailbox is exposed to anyone who knows its location and is completely public. Anyone can come in and drop a letter inside. That being said, only the owner can open the mailbox to read the messages inside. 
So let's apply a symmetric encryption to Alice's and Bob's case. First, Alice and Bob both receive their own private and public keys. These keys, as the name implies, are asymmetric. So public key can lock up the files, but to unlock it, you will need a private key. So what do Alice and Bob do? They exchange their public keys. So now when Alice sends out a file, she encrypts it with Bob's public key. Now Bob can decrypt the file using his own private key. And nobody else, including Alice, can open it since only Bob has the private key. Asymmetric encryption is used widely in networking since it's much, much safer. Encryption can happen without the private key, meaning it never has to be transmitted and thus it cannot be intercepted by a third party. A problem that arises with this encryption is knowing or verifying that the public key you get from other people is really from who they say they are. Someone might want to act as your friend and initiate a communication. How do you know you're truly talking to your friend and not some hacker? That's where certificate authority comes into play. These are authority figures that distribute certificates to companies verifying their public and private key validity. The most popular companies include IdenTrust, DigiCert, and GoDaddy. These companies distribute root certificates that all computers have pre-installed. What makes it safe is that only those companies can issue certificates that would actually work, since they only they are pre-installed on our computers. So all this helps asymmetric encryption, but there are still some flaws. For instance, it's rather slow, with a lot of validation, authorization, and authentication. Imagine if every message that we send would have to be authorized and authenticated. It would take too much time and too much computational power. So the solution exists. The solution to this problem is a shared key for encryption. If you had a channel that is fully secure but slow, you could potentially create a shared encryption key over it and only use it for encryption. The algorithm to achieve this is called Diffie-Hellman Key Exchange Algorithm. And in the simplest terms, it's a way of creating a secure key over insecure communication lines without passing it over to insecure lines. To visualize this, let's go back to our favorite couple again, Alice and Bob. Let's say they both want to exchange information safely. But this time, we have a bad guy named James eavesdropping on their exchanges. To simplify this example, we will use colors instead of numbers. So both Alice and Bob agree upon a public color. Let's say yellow. Since James is listening to their conversation, he also knows this color. But now they also have their private colors, of which James is not aware of. So Alice picks red while Bob picks blue. What happens next is that Alice combines both colors to produce a third color, orange. Bob does the same with his colors, combining public color yellow and private color blue to create a color green. They now both exchange their generated colors, which allows James to know what colors they have. Both Alice and Bob then combine their private colors with this new color that they receive from one another, making the final color brown and completing their exchange. James, on the other hand, cannot produce the same color since he doesn't have either Alice's and Bob's private colors. So now you see how Diffie-Hellman's algorithm enables two parties to communicate over a public channel secretly without it being transmitted over the internet. You may have heard about AES or AES-256. AES stands for Advanced Encryption Standard and it's one of the best modern encryption methods. As a matter of fact, it has never been cracked before. AES is a name for an algorithm that won the AES selection process organized by the National Institute of Standards and Technology of the United States. The number 256 refers to the bit size of the key that was used to encrypt the data. But now, what do you get when you combine strong encryption and the various servers across the planet? Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to talk about the virtual private networks. When VPNs were first introduced, they were used as a way to securely connect to a remote network. This was used by companies to allow remote employees to connect to the primary company network. And this is still widely used today by various companies to increase security. But then the idea expanded to also allow regular folks like you and me to also securely connect and protect ourselves online. Imagine that this is you with your computer and the cloud is the internet. Normally, your computer will access the internet directly via your internet service provider. Now, with a VPN, we are connecting to our remote VPN server forming a tunnel. This server can be literally anywhere. For example, a server in Iceland near a volcano or near Sahara Desert in Africa. Once connected to the server, it accesses the internet on your behalf. This way, the pages you browse on the web think that it's being accessed from the server that you're connected to. So now we have a private, secure, and encrypted connection to the internet. But what difference does that make? Well, to start, if you use public Wi-Fi on a daily basis, a VPN will not allow some hacker to get in you to your system. And it will also block any snoopers that are trying to eavesdrop on you. But this goes beyond just your regular hacker. Your ISP is not a saint either. 
and it can also spy on you or even try to sell your data. Most modern networking protocols use sophisticated encryption methods to stop anyone eavesdropping on your network activities, but some essential protocols are still traveling through the internet in plain text. One of the biggest culprits of that is DNS. Yes, the same DNS that helps us visit websites faster is also a potential bad guy. Since all website DNS requests can be seen by your ISP, it makes eavesdropping really easy. So maybe your ISP cannot see what you're doing inside specific websites, but they can definitely see when you go to apple.com and then straight to samsung.com after. That being said, an ISP can still see that you're using a VPN. This sort of spying can become extreme, and it is in a number of countries. The best example of which is China, where telecommunication infrastructure is controlled by the government. You see, not only this allows the Chinese government to spy on its citizens, but also control what websites and services can be accessed. Without a VPN in China, you can forget about services like Google, YouTube, Facebook, Wikipedia, Reddit, and many more. This is outright censorship, and thanks to a VPN, you can avoid it. But besides security and protection from spying, there are a plethora of other use cases for a VPN. A lot of commercial services online have specific geo pricings. Hotels, flights, and other travel related businesses charge different amounts of money for the same service in different countries. This abusive practice is not exclusive to travel services, but is also common in media streaming platforms and video games. For example, The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, which is an awesome game by the way, costs different amounts on Steam in different locations. The difference could be as high as 80% or more. VPNs, on the other hand, can obscure your true location and change the prices of any given services. Although disclaimer, this doesn't work for everything, since not all services rely on IP information to display pricing. For example, Spotify knows that you're using a VPN, so it will not allow you to buy a cheaper subscription. A VPN today is an excellent tool for securing yourself online. But as time passes, it is increasingly becoming more and more important. Every year, the number of internet-related threats increase, and it seems like governments want to control what you see online more and more. And here at Surfshark, we believe in free and open internet. I hope that this video helped you understand the networks that make the internet and the VPNs that help us browse it securely. If you want to learn more about Surfshark and what we do here, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, like this video, and check out our many other videos just like this one. I'll see you next time.